Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, you watch a lot of crazy stuff on my channel, Butenko Films, and today I am talking with somebody very special. His name is Paul Wheaton. He doesn't need any sort of introduction. He's been in books, movies, and everything in between. He also runs a ginormous website called permies.com. It's permaculture-related and so much more, so you should definitely check that out, permies.com. And this summer... Paul is going to be very active. He's going to offer some permaculture design courses at his facility, which is a really awesome sort of mad scientist facility outside of Missoula, Montana. And I thought it would be really interesting to talk to Paul and kind of do a little digging as to what these permaculture courses entail so that, you know, if you find yourself with nothing to do, maybe you should just head to Montana and learn how to be more eco-friendly, more sustainable, how to spend less money, and how to live a better life. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here's Paul Wheaton. Hello. Hi, Sergey. How for are us, you Paul. today? I'm doing so good. <laughs> oh, and last thing about Paul, he is known notoriously as the bad boy of permaculture. He's sort of like, you know, the biker dude of permaculture. Wow, I it sounds like I need to get a bike. Actually, uh, I have a lot of bicycles, but yeah. I don't have like a motorbike. I, I guess I I won't look very impressive, you know, for that mystique. But uh, I I think that uh, I get the bad boy thing probably because um, there's a lot of schools of thought under the permaculture umbrella, and I prefer a path that might be a little bit different than what most people are keen on. Mm -hmm. Tell us and about so, that path. So, you know, well, actually, let's just break it down real quick. A lot of people have a good idea of what permaculture is, and some people have no idea. So kind of give us the skinny version on what the hell that is. <laughs> so I, I think when it comes to permaculture, the thing I like to say is permaculture is a more symbiotic relationship with nature so I can be even lazier. Um, and that's, that's my little quick uh, permaculture thing. But when you talk about what are examples of where my philosophies are different from most of permaculture, um, there's going to be probably a couple of hundred things where I'm going to leave the conventional path. And I, I think a good example is a lot of permaculture people believe uh, that it's great to use cardboard or newspaper in your horticultural endeavors. And so what they'll do is they'll use cardboard as a mulch for their plants. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not okay with that. I don't want to use that. I'm, and then people try to tell me like, oh, but the inks they use are soy based. Mm -hmm. And it's like the, the inks are like the least of my worries. Mm -hmm. I'm mostly worried about how they found a way to save money when making the paper or cardboard mm -hmm. by introducing certain chemicals. Um, Cause there's a way of making paper or making cardboard where you're basically just taking woody bits and mashing them up and getting the lignans to reconnect all those little woody bits together. Mm -hmm. But they found that they save a lot of money if they add certain chemicals mm. uh, to the process. And those, and, and those can be really toxic. And um, some of them don't break down well, and some of them do break down, but they break down to something even more toxic. And I and I'm a powerful advocate of like I'm trying to to f travel a path that's less toxic, mm -hmm. um, and both with toxins that are known as well as toxins that are unknown. Mm -hmm. um, so that area is an area that's an example of where my philosophies deviate from most permaculture people. So, uh, for example, uh, Bill Mollison. It, and, uh, who created the word permaculture, mm -hmm. he encourages the use of uh, newspaper and cardboard in his horticultural endeavors. Mm -hmm. So does Jeff Lawton. So does Sepp Holzer. All of these permaculture super geniuses are all in favor of using uh, cardboard and newspaper in your horticultural stuff. And I'm, I'm not into it. What do you use instead of cardboard? Um, I prefer chop and drop or another thing that is like a little controversial or where I'm, I'm on my own is, uh, I think 
nearly everybody loves to use a wood chipper mm -hmm. and I feel like there's never, I will never use a wood chipper. And so if I have a bunch of extra branches and twigs and stuff, rather than chipping it, I'll use uh, clippers, but rather than clipping it down to wood chip size, mm -hmm. I'll create a mulch by uh, uh, chopping a branch up into pieces, into sticks that are about a foot long. Mm -hmm. And then, so I'll have a much rougher mulch, but it'll lay flat and it'll do the job that I need. The other thing is, is that uh, I like to take uh, sticks and branches and logs and put those into hugel culture um, rather than running it through a chipper. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in essence, permaculture is kind of just seeing what nature is doing and then using some of that to your advantage to grow food as you know, right now you're talking about farming. So is that, would that be an accurate summary? I would say that about half of permaculture is going to be horticultural. Mm -hmm. I think that most of the people that come to permaculture come through gardening. Mm -hmm. So they, they start off gardening and then they evolve into organic gardening and then they grow past that. And, and then they're looking for well, what's past organic. And I think that's where a lot of people turn to permaculture and mm -hmm. um but permaculture is going to include natural building alternative energy um you know less toxic living mm -hmm. uh, uh conservation and and again i'm going to come back to the thing i said about three or four minutes ago a more symbiotic relationship with nature mm -hmm. and so what all so that includes a, a, a plethora of things i think one of the enormous things in permaculture that is not necessarily gardening is going to be um community or as i refer to it how do you get 20 people to live under one roof without stabbing each other yeah so uh so anybody's been in a relationship with one other person or in a marriage or anything like that yeah. i think you get where i'm going with this <laughs> and so uh, can you share any secrets about how that's accomplished um <laughs> i i think that uh uh the benefits are enormous, you know, um, uh, I mean, basically it's like you could choose to live in a shitty studio apartment, mm -hmm. uh, or for half the price, you can live in a glorious, magnificent mansion with 20 other people. Mm -hmm. And, and it's like half the price and your quality of living has gone way up. And of course the, the, the trick is drama. And so a lot of times when you're living in community, it's, it's like, uh, boy, that drama is too much. So the, uh, the thing we're trying to figure out is how do you grab hold of the volume knob on the drama and turn it from 9.8 mm -hmm. down to 0 0.3? Then all the benef you have all the benefits and hardly any drama. It's, it's easy peasy. Mm. So the question you're asking is how do you turn the volume exactly. knob down to drama? And, and it's kind of like, okay, first off, 90% of all the drama comes from the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what's going to be your recipe to solve the problems in the kitchen? And there's a, a plethora of different recipes. Another one about the drama is going to be, what is your decision-making process for how your, how your group is going to grow, how your group is going to do amazing new things in the world of permaculture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Diana Leaf Christian's got, is the leading author in this space. And she's got two books about, about, uh, intentional community. Mm -hmm. And, um, basically, uh, a lot of people favor the consensus based systems. And, um, it's been pretty much shown that the failure rate is 90%. And if you visit the communities that uh, have existed for more than 10 years, mm -hmm. um, uh, you might question, you know, and this is the success, the, the ones that are successful, you might possibly be questioning whether or not it should properly be labeled as a success. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, a lot of the communities that I have visited in the past um, that are a success, that, and they're a success because they still exist, um, it's difficult to find people that have been there longer than two years. And so um, on the other hand, if you go to uh, um, uh, an abbey mm -hmm. or a convent, there's a lot of people that have been there for more than two years. And that's effectively a kind of community living. Mm -hmm. Then you can kind of explore stuff like, well, what about an old folks home? There's, you know, a couple of hundred people all living under one roof mm -hmm. um, and they're sharing meals and stuff like that. Granted, they kind of do want to, some of them do want to stab each other, but mm -hmm. you know, there is drama there, but the drama isn't too horrible. And they do, there's many people that have lived there for 
a decade or more. Um, and rather than like uh, 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 throwing a tantrum and, and screaming at people and leaving, they, they, their exit path tends to be a different path than that, which we don't need to go into yeah, right we now. Don't. <laughs> but so, but, so what Paul is saying here, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but permaculture affects a plethora of different things, everything from horticulture, which is gardening, to living, even to communities. And you've been great at harnessing all those things because at your retreats, you do everything from building, building solar dehydrators to rocket mass ovens to, you know, implementing revolutionary slash not revolutionary at all gardening principles. Uh, you just teach people how to live better and, and less with less work. I, I believe that a lot of the stuff that we're doing is to share with people how they can have a more luxuriant life with less effort and less cost. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I think a lot of people have the permaculture value set, but they don't understand how to go from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And it's about, it's, it's not like there is a single recipe, but I think a lot of people, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people get really angry about a lot of the problems that they see. And, um, like there were a lot of people that went out to the, um, uh, into the Dakotas, the standing rock thing. Mm -hmm. Like let's, let's protest the oil. And I think a lot of people feel very strongly. How do you have a more luxuriant life while reducing your carbon footprint, mm -hmm. reducing your petroleum footprint? And having less toxic kick in your life, all the recipes that you can find by, you know, doing a quick Google or by, you know, um, um, learning from your, whoever it is you, you're currently learning from, they all seem really, really weak. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's like, okay, so we want to share with people how to do things that are way better. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned rocket mass heater. We, we do advocate a lot of rocket mass heater stuff here. Um, but when you look at the energy footprint, what you hear about is light bulbs, but it turns out that's like 4% of your energy use. Mm. And, and yet they make it out to be like, that's 90%. If you could just solve your light bulb thing, mm -hmm. that solves everything. And it's like, oh, no, 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 no. In fact, the things you've been told about light bulbs actually make it worse. Mm. And so you're probably right now, if I say light bulbs, you're, what are you going to say? LED. Ahead, say LED. And I'm, do you live in a cold climate, sir? I do indeed. And so um, uh, I'm going to tell you, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this in 30 seconds, and then we'll see how you feel about LEDs. Uh -huh. I live in Montana. It's colder in Montana than where you are now. Yeah. Right? Yes. And, and so now it turns out that whenever winter comes along and I need heat is also the same time that it gets really dark. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the days become really short. So wouldn't it be great to have a light source that also produces heat? And Indeed so, of course, it would. The, yeah. the thing that they say is, oh, an incandescent light bulb is so wasteful of energy because like 93% of the energy goes to heat. Mm. And, and it's like, well, um, uh, so if you're in a situation where you're on the grid and you've got electric baseboard heat, then it's like basically you get free light every time you turn on that light bulb. Oh, but wait, there's more. Uh, what if you were to take that light bulb and bring it really close to you? Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like right over your head like this. OK. And now I turn it on. And of course, I don't want to do it like exactly like this because then it's in my eyes. But yeah. the, the, the thing is, is that, oh, man, it feels so warm. The key is, is what if I surround myself with a couple of light bulbs and they're close to me and they're pointed at me and it's they're 40 watt light bulbs? What happens then? Um, uh, and it turns out that if you use wise use in the wintertime of your incandescent light bulbs, you can save hundreds, maybe even thousands of dollars a year for heat. Mm -hmm. Now, which draws way you, more electricity anyway. Um, well, like basically the thing is, is that if I've got a couple of light bulbs near me mm -hmm. and let's say I have a dog bed heater at my feet mm -hmm. and like right now I'm at my desk and there's a, there's a little heated mat under my keyboard and mouse. Mm -hmm. Let's say I turn all these on and then I'm like, oh man, it's way too hot in here. And then you go to the thermostat and the thermostat is already set to 68. And then you turn it down 
to 65 and then 62 and then 60 and then at 58 mm -hmm. and you're like, oh no, now it's comfortable. But the thermostat says it's 58, mm -hmm. but you're comfortable. And so then what's the thing is, is, is here in Montana, 75% of your energy use is for heat. 4% is for light bulbs. Mm -hmm. But now if you just cut, in fact, I, I've got tons of tests where we did all kinds of experiments. Mm -hmm. And I've got a thing, a, a large document that I've written about how I cut 87% off of my electric heat bill. So if you just cut 87% off of your electric heat bill, how much did you cut off? I mean, is that $1,000? Did you just save $1,000? Did a couple of light bulbs save you $1,000? Hmm. So, so now you said LED, and I wish to suggest something else. Now, if, if you, let's say all your house is set up with incandescent light bulbs, mm -hmm. and you read the box on your LED lights, and you spend $100 on LED light bulbs. Mm -hmm. and, but, but let's just, let's go a step further. Let's say you got those LED light bulbs for free, mm -hmm. okay? Give, you got them for free. Uh, so now you got these LED light bulbs, $100 worth of free LED light bulbs. You put them all through your house. How much, how much are you going to save in a year with those LED light bulbs? Not much at all. Maybe like, okay. maybe 100 bucks if I'm lucky. But if you saved 100 bucks, what the hell were you doing to burn up, to, to use a hundred dollars worth of light in your house. Exactly. Doesn't it seem like even it, like if you were using incandescent light and you're spending a hundred dollars a year on light. Yeah. I mean, like you're growing weed in, in your basement you or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> maybe that's it. So it's kind of like, all right, let's, let's say, uh, so what's, if you're using all incandescent light, I would, I mean, like my, when I was doing this thing where I saved all this energy, my light, the amount of, amount of money I spent on electricity for light was $8 per year. Mm. But tell you what, Sergey, I'll give you 30 bucks a year. Mm -hmm. All right. For light. And, and now this, and it's like, so now you go and you switch out to led. Maybe you're going to save $25 a year mm -hmm. because boy, those leds, you got not just LEDs, but they're extremely blue mm -hmm. and efficient. Now your house feels like a prison. <laughs> but but hey, baby, man, yeah. you you saved etheric, you saved some electricity. So yeah. thirty bucks worth, way to go. Now if you've got electric heat, you may have needed to like um, turn the like the thermostat is still set the same as it's ever ever was, but now your electric heater has to come on an extra 30 bucks a month worth mm. through the winter in order to keep you warm. And so did you save anything? Nope. No, you didn't save anything in the, in the summertime, you may have been a little bit cold, but it turns out in the summertime, the days are long. So you didn't really have your lights on much at all anyway. So it's, it's when you had the lights on a lot was in the winter in the time winter, That's yeah. when, it really counts. when they should now, be heating you. Yep. I get it. So on one path, you went down LED road, you saved nothing at all. Mm -hmm. On the other path, you went down incandescent road, but you moved the light a little closer to the human beings, wherever, whatever it is that they're doing. So then they felt so warm that they turned down the thermostat and you ended up saving hundreds of dollars. Hmm. Which one is really saving electricity? That's really anyway, interesting, Paul. This is the kind of stuff that we share. And, and another thing is, is like, uh, uh, we start with the story of a guy who, um, had a business and, and he just, he worked with so many different people. He kept running into people that, uh, had free fruit. And mm -hmm. so the example he gave is like, somebody gave him boxes and boxes of free plums. So he went and he got, had this like a little electric food dehydrator and he dehydrated them in there. And so then he had all of these prunes over the next year. It was like so great. But then after he dried them all in his little electric dehydrator, he got his electric bill, which was $900 higher than uh -huh. usual. Yeah. So those free plums weren't very free at all. Yeah. They turned out to be really expensive. <laughs> so, but it's uh, amazing how simple a solar food dehydrator is. And so um, that's one of the things that we built at our appropriate technology course last year uh, is this, you know, it's like a, it's a, a, a really large solar food dehydrator. And, and it's like there's a lot of foods that actually get better 
when you run them through a dehydrator. Mm -hmm. um, the, the quality is better. The enjoyment of them is better. Um, but on, on top of that, this is probably one of the best food preservation techniques there are. Absolutely. There's all kinds of things you can do. And, and if you dry it very quickly, I mean, that's kind of like the difference between a poor food dehydrator and an excellent food dehydrator is how fast does it dry the food? Because when you dry it very fast, it holds the flavors and the nutrients and, and all the good things. And you want it to be something where it's not exposed to sun. Sun will kind of bleach the food. And you don't want that. Mm -hmm. So what you want is a dark area that has a lot of air passing through it to dry it very quickly. Warm, uh, warmer air, but, but mostly it's about lots of air. So this uh, solar food dehydrator does that. And so folks that come to your permaculture design courses, they will actually get hands-on experience learning how to build things like a solar dehydrator. Uh, that's true. Well, the, the solar food dehydrator we built at our appropriate technology course last mm -hmm. year. So, um, so the maybe, last maybe then let's years. talk about, yeah, what's on the agenda for these next design courses. So we have a permaculture design course that's coming up in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And it's immediately followed by the appropriate technology course. Mm -hmm. And I would say that probably about two-thirds of the students take both together. So they're kind of designed to go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, so the, a permaculture design course is a very formal course that covers um, uh, some very exact stuff. Uh, and it's going to be about how to uh, – it's going to cover a lot of different things. It's going to cover natural building, but it's like a lot of classroom time for a permaculture design course. It's probably typically about 70% um, classroom time. 20% mm -hmm. is when you've got big sheets of paper and you are being required to make a design mm -hmm. for a plot of land. And uh, the, the remaining 10% of the time is hands-on projects. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's going to be all kinds of different things that you're going to get some hands-on experience with building or, or gardening or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's like permaculture college. Yeah, yeah, in a way. That only lasts two weeks. Mm -hmm. But it's like it's 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 gonna, you know, really get you up to speed on design. Whereas uh I mean there's a lot of stuff and I'm I, I put out a lot of information about oh, in fact, this is something you and I have exchanged over the years many times. And I've got Sergey's cards right up there, but here's my cards. And so um but the thing about my cards, much like your cards, is every card has a little of permaculture information. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a lot of people start learning about the little tidbits of permaculture, and then a permaculture design course helps you to glue all the tidbits mm -hmm. together to make a holistic design using your favorite tidbits. Mm -hmm. um, and so a, the design course is about the holistic view. Mm -hmm. The, how does it all fit together? Um, then the appropriate technology course, which comes right after our. So I think we're the only outfit that has an appropriate technology course. I don't mm -hmm. think any other permaculture folks do that. Um, but that'll be a two week course that's like probably 10 percent classroom time mm -hmm. and 90 percent hands on experience. Ah, So then it kind of flips the, the ratio. So in the design course, you learn how and why, and then the next two weeks you sort of apply everything and do more hands-on yeah. stuff. Right, right. So there's a lot of stuff like, okay, we're going to learn about this today, and during the ATC, those of you that are going to be here for that are going to get this experience actually building one, actually making one, of uh, whatever it is. So usually there's about a dozen different projects that happen during the ATC. Uh, usually one or two are really big. I think, I know that this year... Um, uh, the big ATC project, uh, is going to be the, um, the ship rocket mass heater shippable core. Mm -hmm. Everybody will get a chance to build one and either take it home mm -hmm. or since it's a shippable core, they'll be able to ship it to their home. Uh -huh. And, and so it's the hard part of a rocket mass heater. Um, and so you'll be able to make sure that when you leave, you have one of these and, uh, how you use it is, is up to you. There's, I mean, it can be configured in a lot of different ways. You can either configure it so that it's um, a tiny house rocket mass heater or something that has a much larger mass. 
a lot of people build these for greenhouses. Mm -hmm. um, so as a form of heat for a greenhouse. But I, and this is a good time to say, like earlier we were talking about uh, how in Montana, 75 percent of your energy consumption is for heat. And a, a rocket mass heater is something where uh, the energy that you use is the twigs that would naturally fall off the tree in your yard. Mm -hmm. So you, rather than gathering up those twigs and putting them in the green bin and sending them away, then we're saying gather up those twigs and put them in perhaps your garage where they can dry. And when winter rolls around, it's, it's free energy. It, it heats your home. Um, a rocket mass heater heats your home with one tenth the wood of a conventional wood stove. Mm. And you would think, okay, so then it puts out one tenth the smoke, but it actually puts out about one one hundredth to maybe one thousandth of the smoke. Oh, wow. It, uh, the exhaust is usually cleaner than burning a candle. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this is, this is a huge, huge change. And again, how can we make your life more luxuriant while meeting your values? So often people talk about, oh, if I'm going to save energy, it's about sacrifice. How much am I willing to sacrifice? And I, I believe my flavor of permaculture is about how to live a far more luxuriant life while simultaneously better meeting, I'm going to say my values, but like, Sergey, I know you well enough to know that I think your values are identical to my values, or at least very, very close. Mm -hmm. And I think most of the people watching this, their value set is probably very, very close to our value set. Yeah. And, and it's like, but I think a lot of people are like, I want to do better. I want to do better things. But the tools that they have are generally about sacrifice. And, yeah. and so I want to paint a picture of like a more luxuriant life. So a lot of people... In, in my experience, have got the itch to live more closer to nature or go out and start a farm or start homesteading. But then when push comes to shove, they get out there and they're like, holy crap, now I have a whole farm to take care of in addition to my job. I can't travel. I have kids. And, you know, from a foraging standpoint, I've really made an effort to teach people that you can do both. You can forage here and there in your backyard or, or do things that make it really simple so you don't have to prioritize and only be a forager. You can still maintain your normal life. And what I've seen of your practices is similar. You teach people how to have that wonderful garden of their dreams without having to spend ungodly amounts of time weeding it or, you know, so you can reap all the rewards of living closer to nature, but you don't have to sacrifice and my so, I mean, so oh you are you are so singing my song yeah now of course i would have to say that you know there's there's going to be wild crafting mm -hmm. where you're going to go out into the wild and get your own food and then on the other side there's going to be gardening and it's like how about something that's like not just in between but it's closer to you mm -hmm. and it's like okay so let's say i go out and i do some wild crafting and along the way, I drop a few seeds or I don't wild, I don't harvest too much from the wild. Mm -hmm. um, I leave some behind so there could be more next year. Or I, I, as I'm harvesting, I'm nurturing. So that way, um, as each year I come to this spot, there'll be more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, as you, for certain things that you might do, you're going to be feeding the deer. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so it's like, oh okay, yeah, what do I do so yeah. that there'll be more here? I'm a really nice yummy. guy. <laughs> Take care of nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, now, now there's way too many deer. <laughs> yeah. They're eating everything. <laughs> but um, I kind of feel like a lot of conventional gardening is something that I would also object to. And a lot of practices, even within organic efforts, mm -hmm. are something that I would object to. And what I'm going to advocate mm -hmm. is going to be something much closer to what you're advocating. Mm -hmm. And and it's like, uh, I kind of feel like if you're going to like get into your car and drive to the grocery store and buy stuff, then it's kind of like, okay, can I come up with something that can be done in less time? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and, and it's going to cost you less money. Because the other thing is, is that it's like, okay, in order to be able to have the money to be able to buy the stuff at the grocery store, you had to go do some kind of job. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, can we do it? Can we kind of substitute some of that? A lot of people don't do a garden because it is, it does take a lot of time. Mm. And so, but at the same time with permaculture techniques, a lot of these techniques are about giving a gift to your future self. Mm -hmm. So you put the time in now, but the benefit comes back 20 fold mm -hmm. over the next 20 years. And so a lot of perennials, but also you can even grow your annuals where if you do it right, that maybe after five years of, of permaculture gardening, mm -hmm. then you no longer have to do anything but harvest. Mm -hmm. you, you eliminate the need to plant the seeds. You eliminate the need for pest control. You eliminate the need for irrigation. You eliminate the need for fertilization. You eliminate all of those chores, and all you have to do is harvest. Now, granted, on there could be a time when it's like you need more food out of the system, in which case, yeah, if you go in there and you spend a weekend nudging it, you get two or three times more food out of it. You could choose to travel that path, or maybe you just entirely ignore it and only harvest. And if you don't even harvest mm -hmm. you just ignore it entirely it keeps going yeah independently of your efforts so these are the kinds of things i mean when you go out and you harvest wild foods there's nobody out there growing that no and so it's like the systems that we've come up with are due to like okay well how did that, those foods grow in that particular wild patch can I plant a variety? I mean, if you think about it, like pigweed, mm -hmm. pigweed is entirely edible. And so you can go out there and you can harvest pigweed. But it turns out, if you just learn a little bit more about it, pigweed is the same species as amaranth. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting a plant that grows maybe 10 inches tall, maybe you can plant something that grows seven feet tall. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can harvest not just the, the leaves, which is what you were eating before, but you can get the leaves and the seeds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so let's start exploring what will do well in your area. I mean, you know, if you've already got certain weeds coming up, maybe there is an improved variety that will do even better in your space and provide more food. Um, I like the sound so of that. And so rather than like, let's start with like somebody with a rototiller and be like, I don't want to run a rototiller. I never use a rototiller. I don't want you to use a rototiller. I don't want anybody to use a rototiller. And it's like, so instead of looking at that and coming up with variations of that, then what I do is I advocate, look at Sergey and let's do variations on what Sergey mm. is doing. How do, how do we develop? So, so your relationship with nature is something where nature is providing and you're going out to find what nature has provided. Mm -hmm. I'm suggesting kind of the same thing, but I'm saying, what if I were to romance nature just a little <laughs> and, and can I, can I, can I develop a relationship with nature so that on a small patch, I can get 10 to 20 times more food in that patch than you were doing, but just through gentle nudging, not no rototiller, none of that, no plowing, none of that. Just a little bit of nudge here and there. That's what I'm advocating. So Paul, in case you missed it, is advocating. He's going to teach you how to seduce nature for your benefit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about dates, costs, that kind of thing. How do people find you? Um, also, everybody watching, all of the things that Paul says and offers, I'm going to put in the show notes below the video in the description so that instead of having to punch in hard links, you might, you'll just be able to click on something and it'll take you right where you need to go. Okay. Um, the dates are, and I'm, I'm cheating. I'm going to go and look it up because we have um, a peasant PDC going on right now. Mm -hmm. And so here I'm looking at it. So the, the homesteaders PDC is June 23rd to July 7th. And it's immediately followed by the uh, appropriate technology course, which is July 9th to July 20th. And we've got a special price if you get a ticket for both. Awesome. So, and then you provide the links. I'll provide so the links. they'll be able to click on that. Yeah. So there you have it, folks. Uh, about a month away, a little bit less, you can learn everything and more about permaculture design and as well as how to apply it. And I highly recommend this course.
Paul always gets the best experts. Paul himself is very knowledgeable, as I'm sure you've already deduced. And I highly recommend that you at least visit the website and check out what he's offering because, you know, why not learn some stuff this summer while you're on vacation or not? And it's an experience that, it's a gift that you will give your future self. I think that if there's one other thing to possibly add uh -huh. is that we have what we call the Permaculture Boot Camp Program. Mm -hmm. And um, we have uh, three openings right now. Mm -hmm. And that's where people come here for either a few days or a few months. Um, in fact, the guy that's currently managing the boot camp program, he mm -hmm. came for uh, a few weeks. He was just going to be here a few weeks. And he's now been here more than three years. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, uh, but basically it's like, it's, it's all this in practice, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, uh, uh, some people come and they do a, a, a work trade of sorts, but I think most people come just to get the experience. Um, I think right now today they're doing some roundwood timber framing, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and a straw bale structure. Um, and, uh, uh so there's going to be some cob work and some straw bale work and some working with, uh, timbers. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but every day is, is, you know, doing the, the work of, uh, of permaculture of, of building a future. Awesome. So some people like right now, uh, a lot of people are got, getting out of college and what are they going to do all summer? And so, yeah, especially since there's been, no jobs. <laughs> so, um, and this, I, this is not a job. Yeah. Um, well, it's work, but you know, we call it this with learn permaculture through a little hard work. Mm -hmm. And so we have, uh, we have a few openings right now. And, uh, if people want to come and do that. It's, uh, whereas the PDC is very formal and the ATC is also very formal. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to learn a lot of stuff in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas the, uh, the, the, um, the permaculture boot camp is going to be, you know, get up every morning and then work a, a full day doing permaculture things. And, um, a lot of people sent, tend to stay for several months. Um, but a few come for just a few weeks. Sweet. And, so um, I will put beware. links to that as well in the description okay. below the video. Just be aware, if you come for a few weeks, we might might find yourself staying here a lot longer, being part of our community. Paul, thank you so much for your time. Everybody else, thanks for watching. And stay tuned. Subscribe to this channel for more videos just like this that are completely different. <laughs> thanks, Sergey. <laughs>